You be seated. So we are in a series entitled Our Story in Exodus. And we, uh, today we have the uh, meeting of Moses and Pharaoh, the heavyweights. The big showdown is finally about to happen as these two guys come together. When I was thinking about that, one of the images that passed into my mind was the heavyweight boxing match that took place between two of the all-time most powerful, uh, Mike Tyson and Evander Holyfield. Remember that one? Back in 1997. What made that one memorable was that was the fight where uh, Mike Tyson bit off uh, part of Evander Holyfield's ear. Yeah, gross. Made him a very memorable uh, fight as uh, these two guys fought. As I was thinking, though, I said, <coughs> maybe that's not a good comparison because Pharaoh had all the armies you know, of Egypt, and he was the Pharaoh, and, and Moses was a shepherd. Like, what did he have? This was maybe more of a, a David and Goliath. This was a primary underdog kind of fight. This would be like me taking on Mike Tyson, which I wouldn't want to do because I would like to keep my ears. Uh, but, but if you can imagine some of that feeling that, that maybe they were facing um, as these two guys finally met. So let's, let's pick up the story, though. God has, last week we just talked about, God was, uh, had called Moses, uh, burning bush and all, and, and told him to go back to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. <coughs> and in chapter 4, verse 29, we pick up the story. So Moses... And Aaron, who had made their way back, they, they brought together all the elders of the Israelites. So they, they, they go back to the home area and, and they, they bring the, the leaders together. And Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people and they believed. You remember those signs? Some of the signs that they performed, like uh, dropping, you know, throwing the... the the rod down and it turns into a snake and then picking it up and, and sticking his hand inside his garment and pulling it out, it was leprous and then reversing it back to health. And, and all these <coughs> amazing signs that he was shown. And, and the people saw it and they believed. Wow, this isn't just a magic trick. God is, God is certainly with us. Um, I, I wonder though if Moses is still uncertain. You notice it says that Aaron was the one who told them everything. So Moses, Moses may be a little unsure about this all, all, the whole thing, a bit timid. Remember, he was reluctant, not really wanting to go. And so maybe he was still feeling a little bit of that uncertainty, or maybe he wasn't sure how the people would accept him because they had kind of run him off many years ago. And so maybe they weren't, he wasn't exactly sure how this was going to go down. So he said, Aaron, why don't you say, why don't you do this? Although it sounds like Moses performed the signs, but Aaron did the talking at this point. And, and when they heard, when the elders had heard that the Lord ha, ha, was concerned about them and had seen their misery, remember they've been slaves now for many years, and, and they were in agony and, and being beat down and, and forced to labor hard, long hours. Anyway, when they heard that God was concerned about them and seen the ministry, the misery, they, they bowed down and worshiped. And something was born in their spirits. Even though they were exhausted, there was an exhilaration because God had heard them. Hope was born. This thing can take a turn for the better. Finally, they'd been praying, they'd been crying out, they'd been beseeching and asking God to do something. And it had been a long time. And finally, it sounds like God is about to do something. Now remember last week, I showed you a slide in which I, uh, we talked about this process of determining God's will. And we talked about it's not so much that we go to God and say, hey, God, what's, what's your will for my life? But it's, what's God, God, what's your will, and how can I join you in that? And so, um, and the way it works is, is God's got His will, God's got what He's planning to do, and He invites us to take part in it. Right? He wants a relationship with us. He invites us and He speaks to, in Moses' case, through a burning bush. O often for us, it's, it's through God's Word or through um, a pastor or a friend, maybe uh, reading in His Word, or may maybe simply through the Holy Spirit or, or a circumstance. God speaks in many different ways, right? 
And then we have to decide what we do about that. And there comes this moment of, of, of crisis of belief. Am I, am I going to trust God? Am I willing to step out? This sounds dangerous. This sounds scary. It certainly was in Moses' case to go back and confront Pharaoh. And so he pushed back five times trying to get God to you know, find somebody else and finally relented and decided to go. And he had to, in order to do that, he had to make some adjustments in his life. He had to pack up his stuff and, and move back to Egypt. And so he did that. And in so doing, he was aligning himself and setting himself up for God to use in a powerful way. And, and this is, again, this is what, what we need to be aware of when we're thinking, God, what do you want me to do? It's like, well, we need to look at what God's doing and join him, right? Anyway, <coughs> so, so this is what happened. How did it work out? Well, we get into chapter 5. And uh, after Moses and Aaron went to uh, Pharaoh, because uh, it had gone so well with God to, to talking to the Israelites, so they said, okay, now let's go to Pharaoh. And he says, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says, Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. They want to go out and celebrate and worship and sing and, and, and experience uh, freedom. So let my people go, God says, that they may go out and hold a festival to me. At first, it seemed like a short-term request. In fact, a little later, he says, ask for three days. But knowing Pharaoh would turn him down, it, it just became a, a, an easy first step. But the truth is, these people were leaving, and God was asking for his people to leave. Uh, but the purpose of the whole thing, and the thing that it's good to notice behind it, is that they were leaving to ha hold a festival to the Lord, to celebrate and sing and praise the Lord in the wilderness. As I, was, as I read this, I was thinking in the southern Israel border and, and the festival that was hold back, held there back on October 7th, and, and the war that broke out and ensuing, and and it just made me think, you know, as I read this verse about uh, the awfulness of what took place with the, the attack that happened back then. And, and I wondered, you know, <clears throat> you know, in a very similar way, there would be uh, a, an attack that's about to happen in the book of, in history, you know, back uh, 3,500 years ago when this took place. Um, and, and it was a, a devastating time of loss, too. But, but Moses' request wasn't planned to be that way. It's like, hey, it's time to let these people go. They've been enslaved too long. It's time that they are freed to go and celebrate their freedom in the wilderness. So Pharaoh, how did Pharaoh respond? Pharaoh said, yeah, that's a great idea. Why don't you go? No, that's not what he said, right? Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? that I should obey him and let Israel go. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. He's pretty adamant, pretty firm. I don't know who this Lord is. Translation is Yahweh. Who is, who is, I don't know this God. The God of Israel, he mustn't be a very strong God. Look at the Israelites. They're my slaves. I don't know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. And that same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. The very same day, it's almost like he says, I want you to make the, the, real, the connection between what's about to happen and Moses' request. So you know who's to blame for this, what I'm about to say. So he, he calls in the slave drivers and the overseers, these two groups of people. The slave drivers would be Egyptian taskmasters who are driving the, the slaves, and the overseers would be the Jewish leaders that are also um, kind of the spokes, the intermediates, I guess, that go and pass the information on to the people. And, and both of them were in Pharaoh's court that day, and so he gave this order, and here's the order. Next verse. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw. 
Now, the process of adding straw to bricks, if you take uh, the mud and the clay and whatever they were using to create this, the straw was to help to hold it together, sort of the way we put rebar in concrete today to make it stronger. Even straw can help to make these bricks stronger. The, now, they, he's saying, you have to go out and get your own straw when you add it in. We're not going to supply it for you. So the Israelite overseers realized that they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you uh, for each day. In other words, you've got to meet quota, and we've just increased your workload. But no reduction in results. Well, when they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting for them. And they said, May the Lord look on you and judge you, Moses. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials. And they have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Moses, you're toxic. We, uh, we, we, can't, we can't handle this. Go back to the... Uh, yeah, oh, that's right. Yeah, you put a, a hand in to, to kill us. Has, has this... Uh, think about this. Moses is now bad news. They don't want him around. They would like to, to get rid of Moses. Things have just gotten worse and harder. Moses... You're now part of the problem. Now, was Moses really? It's interesting. Moses didn't really really want to come, but he was just carrying out God's command. And he was trying to help the situation. You know, his heart. He wanted to free these people. And yet now he's part of the problem. He's toxic. He's, He's made us obnoxious. To Pharaoh. <clears throat> There's a, a way of thinking going on in our world, in our society, where this is quite common. But you can see it wasn't new. It's the idea that, that people used to evaluate things. They don't evaluate on whether it's true or right. The, now the standard is, has this teaching ever been used to oppress people in the past? And if it has, then it's bad. It's the... Uh, critical race theory. It's the way of, a new way of, of thinking that isn't really that new because it was part of the thinking back then. When people who are trying their best to do the right thing can be made out to be toxic and can be, um, can be seen as obnoxious because they are grouped with the oppressors. There was a, a young man I read about call him Adam, who, whose friend uh, actually came out as a part of the uh, LGBTQ plus community, and uh, he asked Adam what he thought of it. Candidly, what do you think of me coming out like this? And Adam tried to gently say some words, but he put it into text that ended up getting passed around the school, and Adam was then became toxic and nobody wanted to be his friend because of of his response. And you can see how this works in society, especially in a world of social media where it's really blossomed, that you can become something that you didn't want to be simply because you're grouped in with those who are oppressing. And, And that was the case with Moses here. He was now part of the problem. He was toxic. So Moses, feeling the strain, returns to the Lord and says, Lord, why? Why have you brought trouble on this people? Is is this why you sent me? Was this your plan? You wanted to beat me up? You wanted to make my life horrible? Really, God? Why have you brought this trouble on your people? Why have you sent me? I I didn't really even want to go. As I was thinking about Moses' response, the thought hit me that that Moses' first place to turn was to the Lord and with questions. And I thought, 
Actually, that's not a bad response. Because the safest place to go with their questions is to the Lord and say, God, I need help here. This is not turning out how I expected. I think of uh, one of the Psalms that I love in Psalm chapter 13. David writes these words when he writes, How long, O Lord, will you forget me? How long will you forget me? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? That repeated phrase, how long? This is hard, God. Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. And then he says, but I trust in your unfailing love. I trust in your unfailing love. I will sing of the Lord's praise, for He has been good to me. I just love how that short little psalm ends. He's, he, he's reaching out and, and praying, God, how long? And no doubt that's how the Egyptians or the Israelites felt. Uh, God, how long do we have to suffer this? This is how Moses felt. How long am I going to have to put up with this, this being toxic, being turned on, being rejected? Why have you brought this trouble on us? But then he, the psalmist David comes to the place where he re- realizes, no, I trust in you, God. I trust you'll turn things around. And, and if you know the end of the story, we're not going to get to it today, but we'll know that, that, that things turn around for David, things turn around for, for, for Moses too. But at this point, it's kind of a low. It's a difficult moment. He goes on to say, continuous complaint to God, Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people. And you have not rescued your people at all. This whole thing was just a bad idea. Why am I here? What was that burning bush all about? God, why, why am I going through this now? It raises an interesting question. Is it possible to step into God's will and have things fall apart? Does God call you sometimes to fail? And and the answer is, yes, sometimes. You could look at the Apostle Paul when he was standing outside of Lystra doing what God had called him to do to speak to the people and they end up stoning him, leaving him to a point of death. (laughs) Didn't look very good, but... Things turned around for him. And God healed him and the church was born there. Things turned around. God has a way of doing that. But it doesn't mean it's the easy way. And stepping into God's will, he never promised it would be the easy way. But it's always the best. I I was thinking about a time when when, uh, we first started this church. And we had, a, we had a communion service, and, and we did it, uh, it was only a few months into the church, and we decided to do communion a little differently. We held a, held a meal and had everybody came and did like a potluck meal and celebrated it, sort of like they did back in those days um, in times past, because communion was a whole meal, that, the Lord's Supper, and, and they, would, they would celebrate it together and and so we said, let's do that. So we, we planned one. And, and I still remember um, that I made a call. And it was, as I look back on it, it was, it was a leadership failure on my part. But I, I changed something. And the organizer of that event was upset. And they and another family left the church over it. And when you're just starting, and you know that a lot of church plants fail just like a lot of businesses fail in the first five years. And, and it's like, so I was like, I was aware of that. It's like, God, I know you called me into this, but, what, you know, it was hard. When you have people upset and angry and leave over something that seems so small. And it's communion when we're supposed to be together and, and celebrating our unity in Christ. And it's like, God, is why, why is... Why is 
of this happening now. I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you've wondered that before. David was there. Moses was there. Paul was there. Many of the people in Scripture were there. In fact, there was a lot of powerful lessons. In fact, the whole fact that Israel was going to be traveling out of Egypt and spending time in the wilderness before they got to the land of milk and honey, the promised land, speaks of a, the fact that God will often take us through a wilderness period of time. In a time when things seem to fall apart and things don't go so well. And I wonder if it's to help us to learn to trust Him. I, God, here's God's answer. It's a powerful answer. I love these next three verses. In chapter 6, verses 6, 7, and 8, this is what God, how God responds. Therefore, say to the Israelites... And maybe before I go any further, you'll notice I've highlighted the next three wor four words. I, I am the Lord. You're going to see that phrase three times. He emphasizes, it, repeats it. And then there's a little, another phrase in there, uh, I will. And the I wills, there's seven of them in these three verses. As God promises, this is what I will do. So just take note as I read through this. I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with the mighty acts of judgment. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. Then you will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians." I will bring you to the land I swore with an uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. And I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. Seven times, I will. Around three themes. I will, I will free you. I will adopt you. You will be my people. And then I will give you the land that I promised. Freedom, being a child of God, adopted, brought into the land. That's what God promises to do. And he puts his name on it. I am Yahweh. I am the Lord. You can take it to the bank. So the people have to decide. Moses, first of all, because he's given these words. Moses has to decide, can I trust God? Is it real? I look around me, and it sure doesn't look very good, but can I trust God? So Moses decides he's going to trust God with this, so he relays the message to the people in the next verse. Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Moses, you're part of the problem. We're not listening to you anymore. Look at our lives. Look at how hard this has been. This is horrible. And so they did not believe. They did not listen to him. And so here's the question. What do I do when my reality doesn't line up with God's promises? We sang about the wonderful promises of God earlier. But what happens when what I'm going through doesn't seem to line up with that? I think of a, a, a young man, who, young father, who's sitting outside of a hospital, and he's pounding his fists on the steering wheel, and he says this he's in his prayer to God. He says, if you take my son, we're done, God. We are finished. What you... These are strange words considering that this guy, his name is Drew, is a pastor. But his son, his young son has just been born. His name is Lyndon and he had heart issues and was going through a number of operations and Drew was like at the end of his line. He just couldn't handle this. But he writes later, and Lyndon did survive, but he writes later, he said, uh, you know, while I was at that steering wheel in the car outside, pouring my heart out to God, he said, I felt like I was 
had this big bear hug around me, and I was just pounding on the chest of the bear. Is that I just felt like God was there for me. And, and that's, that's a hard place to be. And what's going to happen when you get in those situations? Is this either going to drive you towards God or drive you away from God? When you hit those moments. And for some, they're willing to stand up in the hardships and say, God, I'm going to trust you. I believe you're going to work through this somehow. And I'm going to continue to walk with you. And others will walk away. Like the Israelite people said, no, I'm not going to buy this again. I'm out of here. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher from years ago, wrote, said this once, I have learned to kiss the wave that throws me against the rock of ages. It's a pretty profound statement. The rock of ages, of course, would be a reference in the old song to the God of the universe, the Lord God. And to get thrown against any rock is hard. But he's learned to appreciate being thrown into God is actually the best place to be, even though it is hard. Jeremy Camp, famous uh, musician, um, wrote a lot. He's had 32 top hits uh, in Christian circles. But when, when he met this girl named uh, Melissa, they fell in love and they were engaged to get married and then she finds out she has ovarian cancer. And it just rips their hearts out uh, when they're told it's terminal. And Melissa went on to die. And Jeremy wrote a song after that and actually put out a movie by the same name called I Still Believe. Because in the midst of the heartache and the loss, he still believed. He still chose to believe that God is good even when he doesn't understand stuff like this happening. You know, Jesus knows all about suffering. And that's the beautiful picture that we have from God. Because he went to a cross and gave his life. And he died a horrific death on a cross. 